Welcome to Kaimaki Christian Church. My name is Pastor Danny. It's so good to have you joining us today at Online Church at Kaimaki Christian Church. If you are a first time guest, we'd love to connect with you. You're going to see a connect button show up in the chat feed in just a moment. Uh, if you don't see that button or you miss it, there's also a connect link uh, in the menu up above you. So click that. We'd love to just uh, send you a welcome email and to send you a, a thank you email, a thank you letter even if um, this is your first time here. Even if it's your second time here, go ahead and fill that out so that we can just connect with you. Now, you're in the chat room. You're gonna see a lot of chatting going on and if this is something that's a little distracting for you, don't worry about it. You can always click the notes tab or the Bible tab and that'll move the chat screen away so that you can just focus on the message but we do encourage chat. We love when we chat. We love to see everyone chatting. The pastors are online chatting with you. So uh, participate and uh, let that be part of your worship experience today. If you need prayer, there's a live prayer button that you can click. And once you click that, you'll go into a private prayer chat with one of our pastors and um, you can share what's on your heart. We'd love to be praying for you. I'll be online as well as all the other pastors and we would just love to be praying for you. Um, there are uh, other links that you can explore. Um, if you are in need, uh, click the contact link at the top and let us know about your need. Uh, we're here for you and we want to help you. Well, before I go, there are some folks who want to say hi and send their greetings to you. So let me turn the camera over towards them. Take care. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cheris, graduating from UCLA class of 2020. Welcome to Kamhi Christian Church. Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm part of the UH Manoa class of 2020. Welcome to Kamhi Christian Church. Hi, my name is Mackenzie Gallagher. I just graduated from Wheatson College, and welcome to Kamhi Christian Church. Hi, I'm Kimberly. I'm part of the Kamhi Christian School class of 2020. Welcome to Kamhi Christian Church. Aloha, everyone. My name is Paige Yuen, and I'm part of the Kamhi Christian School's graduating class of 2020. Welcome to Kaimaki Christian Church. Aloha mai kako, Amy Sotoa here. Kamehameha School is graduating class of 2020. Welcoming you to Kaimaki Christian Church online. Woo! Aloha, Jordan May here, high school graduation class of 2020. And welcome to Kaimaki Christian Church online.
Church, it is so good to be here on site at our church. Now, I wish everyone could be here as well, but uh, if you got my email this past week, you'll understand kind of where we are. And but we're in phase one, which means the praise band can practice and rehearse on this stage here while implementing social distancing and uh, means I could preach here on stage as as well and and also Ohana groups uh, if Ohana groups decide to meet uh, in person while practicing social distancing guidelines um, Ohana groups are allowed to do that as you discuss it with with the group so we're in phase one that's exciting phase two is I got to get a haircut <laughs> because it's like oh it's good to be here uh in church it's good to be here and uh we do look forward to having everyone um re-enter uh the church but here's the deal we're going to be safe we're going to be wise and uh and and we're going to seek the lord every step of the way so if you would be praying for us be praying with us through this difficult time in this challenging time but but let me just say also one thing i've said it before i'm going to say it again we are reaching a lot of people more people than we were when we were meeting on site we are connecting with more people than we ever have before and that's something where we can say praise god write that in the comment section praise god god is still in charge it is good to be here and thank you for watching i'm just excited to be here have you ever thought when someone was making history like whether they knew they were making history you know i think about rosa parks um when she sat on the bus and um she wouldn't get out of her seat how she made a um uh, a mark in history with the civil rights movement or somebody like uh, captain captain soley who uh, took off as a pilot and there was engine troubles and he had to return the plane back but it wouldn't make it to the airport and he had to land it in the hudson river and everyone was saved do you wonder like if he said that day today is going to be my mark in history or last week uh, pastor mark dr mark talked about uh some of the early missionaries he talked about henry opakahaia and thomas uh hopu were they making, like, no, they're making their mark in history? I don't know. And our biblical account that 
we get to engage with this weekend, we're going to learn about a young Jewish woman who made a massive mark in history and saved her people from annihilation, from genocide. And her name is Esther. Esther uh, was a Jewish person living in Persia when Persia was uh, the, the ruling body at that time. And, and she was uh, being taken care of by her cousin Mordecai. And Mordecai was her cousin, but more of a father figure. And so Esther actually became queen. And so this is the background in which we get our story. Esther became queen. And the king of Persia picked her out of all the women in Persia. And then there was the number two guy who was in charge. His name was Mordecai. I'm sorry, his name was Haman. Haman was the number two uh, person in charge in Persia. Haman had an attitude. Haman thought he was the cat's meow. Haman had like a, this bloodthirst for people that he didn't like. Haman had an attitude. Haman had this pride issue. Haman was not a good guy. In fact, Haman was a guy that, that coerced the king to write a decree that would commit genocide on all the Jewish people, on all of the Hebrews, which Queen Esther was. She was a Jew. She was a Hebrew. But the king didn't know that. King Xerxes, he didn't know that. Also, uh, Haman, the number two guy in charge, he didn't know that. So that's the setting that we find ourselves in this, this weekend. And, and we have to figure out what is going on and what's Esther's role going to be during this entire time. So there's a plot to kill the Jews. They wanted all the Jews just annihilated. Haman wanted all of the Jews off the entire earth. And so that meant the Jews lived in fear every single day. They felt powerless. They were wondering when this day was going to come, if it was going to come. And then when Esther was queen, she felt like she couldn't do anything. Like she's like, I don't make the decisions the king does. And so we read this in Esther chapter 4 verse 10. Then she instructed him, that's her servant, to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces knew that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned by the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Wow. Wow. She didn't feel like she was the one who was up for this job. She wasn't, she didn't feel qualified. She didn't feel like she could do anything in her position. But Mordecai didn't stop there. He kept pressing her. He kept saying, this is your moment. Because the reality was Mordecai told Esther, uh, Mordecai, her cousin, told Esther that you will surely die as well if they find out, and they most likely will find out that you are a Jew. And so she, right from the get-go, was in a very precarious position, not one to be envied at all. In Esther chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, when Esther, Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. And this is, imagine, like this is fatherly advice you know, is his cousin, but she, he raised Esther like his daughter. Here's what he said. Do you do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape? For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai is telling Esther, maybe this is your moment. Maybe this is your time. Maybe this is when you step up and, 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 and you, you, you make a difference and you save your people. Maybe this is the moment. 
where God finally uses you. Which is interesting, the book of Esther, you'll never find the word God in the book of Esther. You see his fingerprints throughout the book of Esther, but you'll never see the word God, and you'll never see the word pray in the book of Esther. We'll have some thoughts on that in, in just, a, just a moment. But after this fatherly type advice, from Mordecai to Esther, here's what Esther says. Verse 15, <clears throat> Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Say fast. Just say it out loud. Fast. Type in the comments. Fast. Fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. In the Bible, whenever it's talking about fasting, it's always implied that you're praying. So you fast and you pray. What we see here about Esther is that she had a, a heart that was after the Lord. She wanted wisdom. She wanted strength. She wanted the Lord to help her through these fears that she had, to help her through these uncertainties that she had. And so when, when she realized the severity of what was going on, and when she realized maybe this was God calling her to this task, and maybe she was the one to step up, she said, let's pray and let's fast. And church, what about us? In big decisions, do we slow down and do we fast? When we fast, we're giving up something for the Lord, and we're focusing, like when we would normally do that, eat food or, or whatever it is, we would, we would forego that, and then we would spend that time with the Lord. And so this week, I want to challenge all of us to fast something, maybe for a day, maybe for two days, maybe for the whole week. If you could fast food, if that's okay with your physician, then go ahead and fast from food for a day or two or however long you decide. Maybe it's social media. You could fast from social media. Maybe it's the news. You could fast from the news. So what is it that you want to fast from this week? And, and then, instead of doing whatever that is, spend time praying and focusing on the Lord. And as you focus on the Lord, first and foremost, give God praise because he is the creator of all things, that God has no beginning, no end, that God has always been. Amen? So praise God for who he is. And then also spend time thanking God. Thank God for, for your health. Thank God for the breath in your lungs. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for forgiveness. Thank God for salvation. Then, then lift up your prayers to the Lord. Pray for those who are hurting. Pray for those who are sick. Pray for wisdom. And if you would, pray for us, the pastoral staff and the elders, because we have a lot of decisions we're making. And these decisions are not easy and they're not taken lightly. But if you would, pray with us and pray for us as you fast this week. So if you're going to fast this week, if you would, in the comments section, just write, I'm going to fast. And it's not like, look at me, I'm going to fast, I'm almighty. No, it's just, it's just so we're in solidarity with one another. So just write fast, F-A-S-T, I'm going to fast. Or, you know, and, you, and, and, and you don't have to tell us where you're going to fast from, but you just say, I'm going to fast. So we're in this together. So let's fast from something this week. Let's praise God, let's thank God, and let's seek his wisdom. Amen? So Esther fasted for three days, and she went to the king, and, uh, and she knew that she possibly could perish. If I, if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. Esther made up her mind. If I die, I die. She fasted for three days and she goes to the king. And, and she went to the king. And as she goes to the king, the king put out his golden scepter and says, What is it, Esther? Up to half the kingdom. What is your request? Wow. That, that's powerful. Here she's thinking that she can be put to death, and the king says, up to half the kingdom, it's yours. And what we see in the biblical text is that it seems like Esther begins to say, well, king, my request is, and it seems like there's a pause. It seems like she lost her nerve. It seems like maybe she was a little nervous, or maybe she heard the still, small voice of the Lord. Or, or maybe there's other circumstances. I, I don't know, but when she went into the king's chamber, she didn't tell him that, listen, 
your number two guy, Haman, is going to annihilate all of my people. I am a Jew and, and he's gonna commit genocide. He, he didn't, she didn't tell him that there. It seemed like she paused for whatever reason. It's just kind of interesting to think about that. And then she says, if it pleases the king, I'd like to have you for a banquet as well as your number two, Haman. So that night he says, yes, they had a banquet. They had Haman and the king and the queen, and they had a great time. And then sometime during the meal, the king says, my queen, what is it you would like up to half the kingdom? Again, she had an opportunity. Haman was there, the man that coerced the king to say, I'm going to commit, uh, I'm going to commit genocide on the queen's people. Now remember, Mordecai, uh, sorry, uh, Haman and the king did not know that Esther was a Jew. So the king says, what is your request? And, and the Queen Esther, Esther says, my king, if you would permit, permit me, let's have dinner again tomorrow night with Haman. And, and then I'll tell you my request then if, that's, if that pleases the king. The king says, yes, my queen, that's, that's okay. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Here's the rest of the story. Haman goes home. And on the way home, Mordecai is there. Mordecai is the cousin of Esther. Haman goes home and Mordecai and everybody else is supposed to bow before Haman because Haman is the number two in charge. He's royalty. He's, he's Haman. And, but but he, Mordecai doesn't bow before him. And you know what? That ticks off this egomaniac. Haman is just infuriated. He goes home, he has his, uh, his, uh, his advisors there, he has his wife there, and he starts talking about the dinner. I just had dinner with the king and the queen. I am rising up in the ranks, you guys. Like Things are going good for me. And his advisors were like, yeah. His wife was like, yeah. He says, but you know what? All that doesn't matter because there's one person that I can't stand, and it's Mordecai. And his wife and the advisor says, you know what? Why don't you just just erect a pole at 75 feet and tomorrow go to the king and say, hey, I'd like to uh, execute Mordecai on this execution pole that's 70 feet tall. And then he, Haman was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. I'm going to do that. Well, during that same time, the king couldn't sleep for whatever reason. And he does what kings do, I guess, when you can't sleep, you call your servants together and you say, hey, go get the records of my reign. Read to me all the things that I've done as king. Makes sense to me. Um, and so then what happens is uh, the servants are reading to him uh, the, the chronicles of his, of his kingship and what he's been doing as king. And it comes to a part that he totally forgot about. A while back, the king had some of his, some of his uh, people within his, his court who were plotting to assassinate the king. Mordecai, Esther's cousin who raised Esther, Mordecai was going to, uh, he found out about it, he let the king know and he saved the king's life. And then the next day, he asked the servants, hey, what, what, do we, what do we ever do for Mordecai? Do we ever say thank you? And the servant was like, no. He goes, man, we need to thank him. So outside the court was Haman waiting around because Haman wanted to come in and he wanted to ask the king to kill Mordecai that very day. But before Haman had a chance to ask the king, can I kill Mordecai? Before he could even say that, the king says, hey, Haman, what should I do for someone I want to honor? For someone that I just want to praise and say thank you to? And Haman's like, well, he's probably talking about me. Well, you probably should let him ride one of the finest horses. You should probably put some of the best clothes on him. And you should probably parade him around town to let people know how, how special he is and that you're honoring him. And then the king says, that's brilliant. And he says, all right, Haman, go to Mordecai. And remember, Haman, Haman hated Mordecai. And put the, the special robe on him, put him on this special horse, and parade him all around Susa, the capital city of Persia. And, and honor him. And so Mordecai was paraded around the entire city by Haman, and Haman probably hated every second of it. So they, they get home later that afternoon, 
Mordecai goes home and Haman goes to his home and he starts complaining to his wife and advisors and then all of a sudden like that the, at the door is the king's servant saying, all right, the, the dinner is ready with Queen Esther and, and King Xerxes, come on. So then he has to go there. And then you have, uh, you, have, you have Haman, you have the king, and you have the queen. And Haman's trying to figure out what is going on here. But he doesn't have enough time to figure everything out. It's kind of interesting. Go back to the pause. Remember when Esther went into the king's court and she paused? And then within one day, all these events happened. Just something kind of interesting to ponder. Okay, then, then here's what happens in the rest of our story. Um, that same night, so, so, so they're at the, the banquet. And then we read this in Esther chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king asked again, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet. Because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. Whoa. And then the story goes on. So this entire story that, that I'm sharing with you is in Esther 4, 5, 6, and 7. The king got out and he left the room because he was irritated. He was mad. He was heated. And then uh, 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 Haman knew that the king had made up his mind that, to, to have him killed. So he got on his knees and he's begging. He's begging Esther. And he's like laying on Esther. Please, please, please save me. Tell the king not to kill me, please. And as he's just groveling for his life and as he's grabbing on to Esther he the king comes back in and he says what are you doing you're trying to hurt my queen now and he's like oh no you did it and then all of a sudden bam he had him killed on the same execution device that pole that 75 feet long pole and had him impaled on it the same pole that Haman wanted to kill Mordecai on there's a lot in this story but one thing that is so beautiful in this biblical account is that Esther's boldness is clear. She was scared at times. She was timid. She was like, I don't know if I'm the right person, but she was bold in the Lord. She sought the Lord through prayer and through fasting. And, and like I mentioned, the book of Esther never mentions God. It, it never mentions um, the covenant. Uh, doesn't mention prayer, and, and it doesn't mention why Mordecai would refuse to bow down to, to Haman. So there's lots of things this book doesn't, um, uh, doesn't address, but I think the refusal to have God mentioned in this is, is very powerful. Perhaps sometimes God's deliverance comes when human beings accept responsibility to use the position they are in. Not to use it like, like you're abusing it, but to use it in a wise sense. That, that is, human beings act in faith with courage as Esther committed herself to doing. But as we act in faith, we don't know whether or not God's going to come through in a big way or not. We act in faith that God is going to do something, though. But we don't know for sure, but we have faith that God is going to do something and show up big time. And so maybe the book of Esther is, is, is partly about that, encouraging you and I. That it would be nice sometimes to get that audible voice, here are the things I want you to do. But maybe the encouragement for us is this, is that we seek wisdom. We seek God in prayer and fasting when we're making big decisions or when we're making any decisions. And what an appropriate time to put that into practice than right now during this pandemic. What an appropriate time to put our faith into action. What an appropriate time to, to seek God during uncertainty. 
One scholar says it this way, Esther illustrates the way that courage and faith are not incompatible with fear and hesitation. Indeed, they come into their own in the context of fear and hesitation. If there is none of these latter, who needs faith or courage? Church Ohana, there are times as believers that we will have fear. There are times as believers that we'll have these insecurities. There are times as believers that will question certain things. But it's during those times that let's seek God, let's seek wisdom, and let's act in boldness, knowing that our God is a big God. Amen? You could write, our God is a big God. And, and so this week, what will your decision be for such a time as this? What is that for you in your life? For such a time as this, that God has put you in this position. For such a time as this. And I'd love to hear those stories of what God does in and through you. And after you fast and pray and seek wisdom, go and do. Live out your faith. We have an active faith. A faith that is alive. It's not dead. So, as you do that, perhaps... You'll be putting your stamp on history, your stamp on the kingdom of God. How cool is that? How cool is that? Well, church, some of you may know Sabrina Young. She's been a part of our church for many, many years, and she loves our youth ministry, and she's such a blessing to our youth ministry. Um, she she uh, is the first princess of the Narcissus uh, uh, beauty pageant. And, and, and I've asked her to share kind of her story of how she's taken advantage of um, these different moments, uh, these, these such a time as this, such a time as this, these types of moments. And so uh, let's hear from Sabrina Young. Aloha, church family. My name is Sabrina Young. And this year, I have the honor and privilege of representing the Hawaii Chinese community as a member of the 71st Narcissus Court. For those of you who don't know, the Narcissus Queen pageant was established to connect young women of Chinese descent back to their cultural roots. Uh, they offer classes in personal and professional development as well as Chinese culture classes um, in history and cooking, in calligraphy, a number of different things, and it's been amazing. It's been something that I've always wanted to do, uh, and you can ask, you know, Pastor Kainoa, when I first came to this church, about 10 years ago, and I told him about it, and he taught me my princess wave, which I have practiced religiously for the last decade. Um, I will now give you a lesson because I want to add value to all of you. You can all practice in your living rooms. We're going to go elbow, elbow, wrist, wrist, okay? Follow me now. I'm going to go elbow, elbow, wrist, wrist, okay? And you go like this, elbow, elbow, wrist, wrist, turn from side to side, turn from side to side, and you are done. Amazing. All of you can be a princess. Um, but while I've practiced that, you know, a lot of preparation there, and it prepared me for my royal position that I hold now, I also got to prepare in other ways. Being able to speak in front of crowds, being able to speak to small children and adults, uh, because we get to take lots of pictures with small kids, as well as adults, and be able to have these wonderful Chinese dinners with members of our Chinese business community. Um, you know, I also gained confidence that I was fearfully and wonderfully made, that I am fearfully and wonderfully made by an incredible creator. You know, my parents poured that belief into me over the, over the years that I've been alive. And they also said things like, Sabrina, you need to work on who you are before you work on how you look. Once you start putting on makeup and focusing on how you look, people will be drawn to you. But when they get there, what are they going to find? Right? While the poise and makeup classes that I did take over the, the four months leading up to pageant helped a lot with being on stage and not looking like a clown, uh, the major growth happened before I even signed up to run in the pageant. And I think that goes the same way for all of us in a lot of parts of life, you know, where there might be a sprint toward whatever we are looking to do. A lot of that's been built up over years, right? And now and as I'm in this position of influence as um, I get to have a title for a year, you know, during this time at home, myself and the court, we've been able to write cards, we've been able to send out some letters, um, and packages to our frontline workers, and it's been awesome, you know, as much as I enjoy the princess life, 
the opportunities to serve from it and the chance to bring smiles to the faces of small children, um, I know that we have all, all of us, have been put into our own spheres of influence. A couple of my spheres are ministry related, so I thought I should share those. Um, some of you may not actually know who I am, you might not recognize me, because I'm usually with the youth. Um, so if you have a teenager and they do not know me, and yet you send them to the 1030 service, they're not coming. Sorry, just ratted you out, guys. Um, but honestly, I love our youth. Our youth are incredible. If you don't know that yet, you should, because they're amazing human beings. They are insightful. They are deep. They are playful. They are hilarious. They are real. They are genuine. They are amazing. They have gone through crazy things, you know. And yet, they turn to God, you know. They're awesome. They're working through life. And it's amazing to be able to be a part of that. Um, I have also had the chance to do peer ministry on campus at the University of Hawaii at Manoa um, as a part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. I've been able to serve on the student leadership team and most recently uh, a volunteer staff. So during my time in leadership at InterVarsity, I've been blessed to ride the roller coaster of life with other college students. And I do mean roller coasters. It has highs and lows and those highs and lows are very high and very low. Um, thank the Lord. He is the God of the hills and the valleys. Can I get an amen? Oh my goodness. Um, during my time in college, I was also a part of the American Society of Civil Engineers, Chi Epsilon, which is a civil engineering honor society. Had a couple internships and, uh, you know, led an engineering Bible study called Engineers for Christ. I don't know if you can see my shirt, but I'm repping them right now. Um, it's also called EFC for short. But during my senior year of college, I had the chance to meet a freshman engineering student who signed up, you know, we completely divine appointment. Okay. We set up a table at this freshman welcome event operating as a club, which we were not. We are not a club. We are Bible study. Anyway, divine appointment. It was amazing. We were able to set up as a club. She was one of three people who signed up to hear more about this, our club. And, uh, you know, I was like, we talked to another 10 people. I actually didn't meet her that day, uh, but she signed up and we followed up with everybody. And she was the only one who came out to a single Bible study. <laughs> uh, but she didn't actually come out to the first few. But because of the preparation I had done, um, doing campus outreach for three years leading up to that, you know, kind of like the pageant. I had done preparation years before that prepared me for the big day. I had done preparation with campus ministry for years before, so I now have a three contact policy, okay? So basically how it goes, like text, call, message them, whatever, uh, three times. And if they do not respond, they are ghosting me and that is okay, or I have the wrong person, they give the wrong number, it's fine, they don't want to talk, it's not a big deal. But if they respond, we are persistent. And apparently, according to her, uh, it was this persistence that made her eventually decide to come out. She came out to like our third or fourth Bible study. Um, but I'm going to wrap up our entire experience, okay, in a bit of a nutshell. We would meet every week before a Bible study for about an hour. We'd just talk, build a friendship, and she was looking for a mentor in her field of study. I happened to fit the bill. You know, she was looking for someone who was kind of involved in engineering, who could show her the ropes, who was doing reasonably well. Um, and I was also talking about this Jesus guy that she was looking to hear more about you know fast forward to january of 2019 uh, she became a christian praise the lord hallelujah it was amazing incredible triumph there's a party in heaven it's amazing right fast forward to fall of 2019 she is co-leading the bible study with me and fast forward even further past this point uh this coming fall she will be leading the bible study can i get an amen that is amazing. Um, but, you know, now she is someone who I would consider to be a close friend. She is someone who is on fire for Jesus, hungry for the word of God, and talking to her friends about her faith every chance she gets. I am so blessed to have been able to partner with Jesus in discipling her over the last two years. But it's kind of crazy because I remember when I first was thinking about mentoring her and answering this call and being very apprehensive because I 
one, had never discipled a seeker before. I hadn't even discipled anyone who hadn't grown up in church their entire life. Two, I was crazy busy my senior year. Like, I was involved in a number of different clubs. I was also in leadership positions in those clubs. I was finishing up my senior capstone, which takes a lot of time. And by a lot of time, I mean that I didn't leave campus till after 10 p.m. most nights for most of the year. It was a lot. Uh, but at the same time, my staff, my university staff, he encouraged me with the story of Esther. That maybe, just maybe, this student was one of the reasons why I came to UH Manoa. Maybe she was drawn to the accomplishments I had accumulated over my time in college. Who knows? She was already in answered prayer, okay? One bigger girl, she was a freshman, and she was a non-Christian. Three demographics we prayed fervently for. Um, you can ask Sabrina Summer, she was at that prayer meeting, because, you know, me and her were the only girls when we first started this Bible study. There were a bunch of guys. It was a great time. Uh, but, you know, for our vision for this Bible study was so that the engineering department would know the love of Christ. Not just the Christians in the engineering department would have a place to hang out. It was so that everyone would know the love of Christ, because we believe that everyone should know. Um, but, you know... While this journey has been a roller coaster, it really, really has, and it hasn't been easy, it hasn't always been life-giving even, the presence that I now live in, in seeing her relationship with God, seeing her impact her friends, and seeing her build a community of believers and non-Christians alike who are comfortable being themselves, who feel welcome, that decision to say yes to Jesus, that decision was worth it. I love the story of Esther. I really do. The story of a person in a position of influence and the power to speak up and make a difference. While speaking up came at a cost, so did not speaking up. If she chose not to speak, the Lord's will would have been done another way. But maybe, just maybe, that's why she was there. I love how Mordecai says, who knows, right? Who knows? Um, and I, I reflect on the last couple of years, who knows? what my friend would have done had I not chosen to say yes to Jesus, had I not chosen to mentor her or been willing to do that. Um, she might have come to know Jesus, you know. I don't personally think that I'm big enough to ruin the plans of God. But I know that I probably wouldn't be able to consider her one of my close friends. I probably wouldn't be able to know how much she loves Jesus and know that I had a small part to play in that, right? I probably wouldn't be able to say that I was on that journey with her. And, you know, I'm excited for her journey in the years to come, as well as all of ours, as we choose to partner with Jesus for, for the times when, who knows, but that we have come to our royal positions for such a time as this. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, my day or my night. Waking or sleeping, Thy presence, my light. Be Thou my wisdom, and Thou my true word. I ever with Thee, Thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father,
Christ in my heart. I, King of heaven, my treasure thou art. I, King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys all bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still Hi Church! Well, I'm holding here a card that Brian gave to me on our third date together. We had spent the day together, we'd actually gone paintballing, and he gave this to me that night along with some flowers. And you know, as I look at it today, I'm just taken right back to that time. I'm reminded of the, the emotions and the feeling. I'm reminded of the time that we were falling in love. And uh, you, you know, a sacrament is something that can be ordinary but that has great significance because of what it represents. And you know, communion, the bread and the juice, the sacrament of communion is significant to us as believers because of what it represents. It represents that moment in history where time stood still and the savior of the world was beaten and bruised and crucified as a sacrifice for you and for me. It reminds us of the unfathomable love that God had for you and I, that he would sacrifice his very son. It's designed to remind us that we have a healer, we have a redeemer, we have a savior, we have a best friend, somebody who loves us more than we'll ever fully be able to comprehend. And so as we uh, take communion together in just a moment, my prayer for us today is that we would know the love of God. We would know the love of Jesus, not just up here in our heads, but that we would know it in our hearts and that this time would just be powerful for us um, as we partake together. And so right now we're going to have a song play. Why don't you go and get some bread or some juice or whatever you have that's sort of like that and um, hold on to it and uh, I'll come back and we'll pray and we'll, we'll take that together. Blessed 
together. Father, I thank you that we can come together, even though we're all in our own homes, but that we can take communion. Lord, I pray that as each of us do this, in this very moment, that you would show us, reveal to us, give us a sense of your incredible love. Lord, that it wouldn't be head knowledge, but that would be something we would all uh, really be able to grasp in our hearts. And I pray today, God, as we Take communion that you would be so real to each and every one of us. Bless everybody participating right now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, why don't you take the bread and the juice, and then um, we're going to get ready to give in just a moment. Church, as we give today, I'm reminded to keep an eternal perspective and a heavenly focus because as we do that, we're reminded that we're not to be about building our own kingdoms and just putting our finances on the things that we want and need. We're reminded to invest in God's work here on earth and that builds up treasures for us in heaven. We're told in Matthew 6, 19, what happens when we invest in ourselves and and when we keep our own treasures and we just are focused on that. Well, rust is going to come. Moths are going to come. It's going to be destroyed. And we're told that if we would invest in God's kingdom, uh, if we would keep a heavenly perspective, if we would invest into the work of God, then we're building up for ourselves treasures in heaven, which can't be destroyed. So my prayer for you and I today is that our focus would be about heavenly things, that our focus would be about God's business, not our own, and that we would give generously today. Amen. Well, thanks, Brian, for that uh, awesome message and encouraging word on extraordinary stories, God using ordinary people for the extraordinary, God's stories, his story. And um, as we close our message today, our service today, I just want to say thank you for joining us. Again, if you are new here, Click that connect link and let us know. We'd love to just connect with you and uh, let you know how much we appreciate you. Um, don't forget, there are some, uh, some special announcements coming up, so pay attention to those. And um, take advantage of the, uh, the offer for dropping off a food box. Um, if you know of someone in need, whether it's a neighbor or a friend or a coworker, we have food and uh, we'd love to give you a box that you can bless them with. So. Um, Send an email to um, uh, the email address that will appear on the uh, promotion slide that will appear after our church service today. Once again, we are online. Continue to see us online here at kaimikichristian.online.church. And uh, I'll leave you with this benediction. It's a benediction that's really close to my heart, and uh, I hope to bless you with this. So um, receive this benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you all and have a great week.